What is going on, Legends of Rune Terra players? Ryan F. and Miles here with the wonderful, the caster, the master, the boulevard, the guy who's still been playing a lot of the game while I've been getting my PC fixed. And as you may have noticed, we took a bit of hiatus, but we are back and we're going to be doing weekly podcasts for you every time that we can. Boulevard, how's it going? We took, we did two podcasts. We did and then three. I just couldn't upload the third one because my computer we was shot just like, like five of these. And then I, I haven't checked in on them. And all of a sudden I found out we've only uploaded like two of them. I'm like, brother, where is the cast? Where is the podcast? I've been working. I cannot be a caster without my podcast. That is fair. Yeah. We uh, had some technical difficulties on my end. And since I was the one doing all the boot work, uh, Boulevard here just comes in to speak some words for an hour and then disappears into the ether. I do all the talking. Yeah. He does all the technical stuff. I do all the, I do my own technical stuff all right just leave me alone i do my own stunts yeah so we've resolved those issues we will be back on a weekly schedule and thank you very much for joining in once again this is the lore brothers call we are some brothers who play legends of rune terra and that even the title has like kind of fallen off because i have been most of the time i've been playing actually has been expedition just because the ladder grind just feels very faceless when there's just a four digit number on your rank and you're just like i could grind to get a two digit number or a one digit number and it's just like not that doesn't really give me that dopamine hit that i'm looking for when i play games and and team fight tactics just came out so i have been playing a bit of that but legends of runeterra has really definitely peaked back up for me with the most recent patch um on one of our unreleased episodes we did a pretty in-depth talk about uh just what champions we thought actually were the weakest overall and some of the ones on that list ended up getting some pretty decent amount of love Callista, for example have you have you been enjoying the Callista changes at all I haven't actually touched her. As far as I can tell, she still absolutely sucks. Yeah, the the death condition um, on the on the to just to get to level hold up seems a little bit uh, unachievable, just because she needs to see so many units die. Like you can play Thresh in similar decks, and he his level up condition is just about the same, but easier because it's only opponent units, whereas Callista's level up condition is only your own units. Is that correct, or am I? Uh, it's yeah, it's it's only your own unit. She has the exact same level up condition as yeah. Lucian, except she can't see Senna die. And of course, Lucian having first strike, you know, being a little more aggressively statted for the two drop slot versus like the three the three health on Callista doesn't feel super impactful, and like she can just get blocked by things with three attacks. So like she has felt utterly useless. Yeah, I when I first saw that change, I thought the Black Spear nerf in tandem with it might be good, but then I'm also like, wait, like she's the deck that wants to play Black Spear, and when you play a Kalissa deck, you get even more Black Spear because it's yeah. her Black Spear, right? So that nerf actually hurt her more than the t the nerf to Black Spear hurt her more than the toughness buff did. And because Piltover yeah. is seeing so much play right now and get excited just killing a champion feels super good. Uh yeah, no, she kind of fell off a little bit harder. I was so She's hyped got for some Kalissa. She's got some good, like, dream scenarios where if the toughest unit or, like, the most powerful unit in your deck is the Rekindler, then, like, you can attack with Callista. You will always revive a Rekindler that will bring back an upgraded Callista. Mm -hmm. But that brings us into our first subject, which is the rise of combo decks currently in the <laughs> format of Legends of Runeterra and how much they have come into fruition. And it's really, like, if your late-game combo is going to be like, oh, a Rekindler has died this game and my upgraded Callista is reviving that to bring back an upgraded Callista, you're going to die to a 30-30 they who endure getting atrocities at your face. Right. Um, when the Legends of Runeterra metagame first kind of came around, the only real combo deck that we saw was just Heimerdinger. Um, you know, you had some meme decks, a lot of streamers were playing some fun stuff, but really it was like Elusives hit you in the face, Knock Spiders hit you in the face, um, Hecarim hit you in the face, and as those kind of degenerate, just like actual tempo focus strategies have fallen to the wayside, uh, you come to find that in a game where you can only attack once every two turns, there's only like a couple of aggro decks that can really survive in that format. Control decks just get a lot of leeway to stave off a, an attack turn, and then they get two more mana crystals by the time it's your attack turn again. And I feel like that's actually helped a lot to make the, the combo decks kind of solidify. And especially in the sense that like they have very clear and defined windows of, okay, um, if you're dealing this much damage on turn one, you're dealing this much on turn three. Uh, on turn five, you can kind of figure out if you're going to die on turn seven or not. Um, how much you need to block on turn five then, like what your trades need to be. And because uh, of that kind of back and forth on combat, it actually feels a lot easier to plan out combos than it does in perhaps other games. Yeah, the other thing is that we even, it, before the most recent round of buffs and nerfs and things of that nature, we saw a very large, um, basically a meteoric rise in combo decks with the Frostbite Ezreal, everybody figuring out that Elnix were a good package in that deck, subsequently followed by everybody absolutely hating the concept of Elnix in their entirety. Mm -hmm. uh, so it went from like a Reddit meme to like a tier one deck overnight. 
Uh, and then people were like, you know, now that the Elnix got nerfed, it's like, okay, well, that opens up a couple of different avenues for Ezreal. And we're currently seeing Ezreal run the meta in both Draven and Karma decks. Uh, you know, Elnix were just far and away the best way to run the deck. Now that they're out of the picture, we can experiment and open up the Ezreal room a little bit more. On top of that, as you mentioned, Heimerdinger decks have always been prevalent as a combo deck. And then most recently, we got a pretty interesting line of changes where it's always fun to see the evolution of a deck, right? Like, that's one of the reasons that you stay, you keep up with the ladder and you keep playing is to see these things evolve. So Iceborne Spiders. We saw the change to Iceborne Legacy going from a three-mana burst speed spell that gave all units plus one, plus one of that type to a slow spell five-mana that gives them plus two, plus two. So obviously, everybody was like, okay, well, you know, Spiderlings. I believe it was, I think it's Mago GX. I might have butchered that name. Uh... They were like number two on the ladder for the longest time, maybe even hit number one a couple times, but they went off on Twitter because they didn't like the change because I, I think I had run into either them or someone who net decked their deck playing it pre-buff where it was just the three mana Iceborne Legacy. They were playing a spider aggro deck where you would buff up your spiderlings and I'm like, all right, cool. So obviously that was everybody's first thought after the Iceborne Legacy change. Is, okay, we'll play this on spiderlings. We'll get the dream off. We'll get five, five spiderlings. And that kind of devolved to the point where like, okay, well you cut the Iceborne Legacy and now we're just like a, a they who endure atrocity deck. And yeah. you went from this weird combo-esque aggro deck to just this like complete combo deck yeah I, I when i first saw the change to iceborne legacy i was like wow that's like very viable now where i thought it was like kind of cool ish earlier but the, the the fact that it gave plus two plus two made it so that seeing a single copy felt like it was actually playable um but what i didn't really take into account was um the fact that it became slow speed and that honestly killed the card even more than before because when the card's slow speed and you're trying to buff your one one they just vile feast it they just you know throw a mystic shot at it and then when the unit dies before the iceborne legacy actually resolves you no longer get the buff on all your units and you just threw five under the bus to have absolutely nothing happen so it actually i think made the card worse but it, it's so funny that this change is what made the iceborne spiders deck kind of become more popular and now the decks just aren't running iceborne legacy at all and i'm not sure if the deck would have been as good when you had two mana black spear and full power hecarim or if like the combination of nerfs on the best decks as well as just the the idea that this deck could be good is what really brought it into the the, the forefront um do you think that this they who endures combo would have even been good back before the patch at all so post patch i've definitely seen a lot less ionia mm -hmm. than i was before mm -hmm. uh, i think part of that is the rekindler nerf was like it was something that we saw big in like harrowing decks and the harrowing decks have kind of taken a backseat. uh harrowing also one of the premier combo decks from pre-patch that I, I blanked on earlier because harrowing is so a weird one -card to, combo. yeah it's so weird to call it a combo deck but it really is it's just like i'm getting to my combo and what's your combo it's like oh i played units during the game and then i played a card and they're like wait that's a that's yeah, a control so like deck, I've, right? No, 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 it's a combo I've deck. Seen a, I've seen a bit less karma control and karma combo and things of that nature. So I've seen less Will of Ionia. Mm -hmm. And I think Will of Ionia was a big thing that was stonewalling out this They Who Endure Atrocity deck. Because Fair. I'm not sure how it works with They Who Endure specifically. But I know that if I were to play a Mist Wraith, and mm -hmm. then you Will of Ionia my Mist Wraith, when I replay my Mist Wraith, it's a 2-2. Regardless of how many Mist Wraith buffs I have. So it, it oh. it's possible that Will of Ionia actually resets They Who Endear to a 1-1. One, one. I'm not sure if she works the same way as Mr. Wraith. I don't, I don't think, think so, she but does it could because be wrong. she's tied into herself as opposed to all additional copies. But mm -hmm. even then, like, they, if, you know, you play six mana for a unit and then you play six mana to try and kill me with it and I disrupt that play in any capacity, you're pretty much out of gas. And the deck does have a lot of trouble keeping card advantage. So, like, it's a pretty fragile combo. Uh, so I can understand why, you know, even now, like, it's not seeing a whole, whole lot of the success. It's definitely popular because it's a very interesting deck. It's very fun to play. It's very interactive. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely think that, you know, it's something that we're going to see evolve a little bit more as time goes on. Uh, I think right now they play Elise, Thresh, and Trindomir, which originally they were, like, only playing Elise. So that just goes to show, like, they're not as reliant on the combo. They're like, okay, we do need, like, this Trindomir to finish you off. We need Thresh to try and pull the Trindomir out of the deck even because we just don't hold cards very well. And Thresh is really easy to evolve in that deck. Yeah, because you're, you're just throwing so many little guys down, for sure. It's definitely too easy to evolve. Um, one yeah. thing that I think really puts this deck up there is uh, it's actually pretty good against um, the number one deck, the deck that's kind of the most popular right now, which is the Demacia Bannerman, right? Um, you get a lot of little guys out, and as long as you're not feeding Fiora too much and you have some way to interact with her, um, you're able to pretty much block all of their 4-4s four or 5-5s. Five and then, as we talked about before, uh, you're able to stave off lethal for, like, two or three combats, which is going to be turn 5, turn 7, turn 9. As long as you're throwing out enough dudes and then dodging Judgment, you're able to really survive long enough to, to get your combo online. And this whole time that you're throwing spiders under the bus with Elise and Crawling Sensation, you're just getting your They Who Endures bigger and bigger until you can just 
play it and atrocity all in one turn and maybe even kill them. Another thing that this deck has is Ruination, and even though it's so good at, like, it's the one deck that's so good at throwing out enough units to just chump block under the Demacia Bannerman, and then also have the board clears to just clean them up completely. Um, and that's another, like, stall tactic where it can, it just has, seems to have a good matchup against that deck. Is that an incorrect assessment? I haven't actually played it, but it looks like it, right? So when the meta first changed over with the most recent rounds of buffs, um, or nurse and buffs rather. So I I had just gotten done casting a, a fuck ton of the Korean Invitational. So I had seen a lot of the Demacia Bannerman deck because it was easily one of the most popular decks throughout the tournament. Mm -hmm. I got very familiar with that deck and how it plays. And obviously people were excited for the Mage Seeker rework. So like Heimer Lux yeah, was yeah. expected to be like the most popular deck on ladder. Ruination absolutely bodies that deck. Yes. The meta right now with Ionia being less popular. Ruination is just insane. Like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to build a War Mother's Call deck with three Ruination, and, like, I'm just going to destroy all the Heimerdinger decks. Uh, so I think Ruination has, like, definitely been something that just, like, blows out a lot of the meta right now. It, it's kind of weird, though, because you have to find, like, the exact perfect moment to get it down, and I've seen players lose because they either tried to, you know, play it, like, almost nobody plays it too soon. They try too hard to hold on for too long getting value out of it to the point where, like, they're actually overrun. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, now I need to play this, like, while well, they have, like, six cards in hand because I let them sit with the six units for too many turns, and they just get to replay everything afterwards. But yeah. I definitely think Ruination is, like, very strongly suited in the current meta. Yeah, and I was thinking with Ruination just kind of being good right now with less Ionia popping up overall, uh, that a War Mother's Call deck would be good. It was even popping up a little bit last format before Ionia X really took over with all the Karma and stuff. Um, but you think about it, War Mother's Call is this turn 12, or, or you know, 12 mana... Pretty much it's a win condition, but some decks, especially Bannermen, still have time to get in enough damage before you pull out too many units. Um, it's especially weak to decks like the the Noxus Aggro, like Noxus Jinx, uh, even Noxus Ezreal, I would say, where they just combo you from 20 and you can't really deal with that. But what makes the Endure, uh, the the Spiders so good is that the the 12 mana you would spend on War Mother's Call is just 12 mana using to play a They Who Endure and then kill your opponent. And if you're just yeah. killing your opponent, that's better than killing your opponent in three turns. Um, and then it also has a lot more early game interaction to interact with the Piltover aggro decks and stuff like that. Yeah, and They Who Endure is really difficult for the Demacia decks to deal with. It is oh, another sure. like added bonus of that deck. It's kind of weird because I think They Who Endure Atrocity is like the only combo in the game that gets disrupted by Purify. Yep. <laughs> but Purify is so... It's in such an awkward spot right now with how many Ezreal decks you have running around that like... I definitely wouldn't blame anybody for not running it in their deck. Mm -hmm. You think so that it, isn't pure? Wouldn't purify be good against an Ezreal deck because they play their Ezreal and you just? Oh, it's only followers, isn't it? Never yeah. Mind. Okay. Yeah, I, th yeah, I thought yeah. you were like making a joke here, no, 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 but no, no, you're no, actually no. just. I, I'm, I'm just like this seems insane. Like, what are you talking about? Like, oh no, no, they play like two followers in their whole deck. It doesn't do anything. Now that makes sense. And then purify is also in the bannerman like near, not especially attractive. I would imagine. Uh, Maybe on like a Senna. I mean, it can find value okay it's not great but it can yeah, find yeah. value i mean like if it's a one of to never lose to to they who endure i, I can't imagine that well it the problem is like the, the, the bannerman decks don't maintain cards very well like if they of lose course, the board nine times out of ten they're going to concede so if you draw something dead like a purify in the wrong situation like you could just lose the game for it yeah they're very dependent on having a large massive meaty board and then hoping that it kills you before you can really deal with it but yeah so one thing on this uh, Mobilytics tier list that I like to reference from time to time is that Elusives is still in the S tier, specifically with Freljord. Is that something that you've been really seeing a lot of? No. Um, yeah, I, was... I think that those decks are particularly weak to things like the Ezreal Draven, mm -hmm. where it's like a more aggressive Ezreal deck. So like, I get to race you in the early game. I still have all of this really cheap removal for your Elusives and things like that. And with the attack buff on uh, Navori Conspirator, you just don't race me that well. Yeah, and I constantly have blockers for all of your non-elusive units and things like that. There's a lot of like all the aggro decks right now feel like they don't maintain cards super well. So if you can stonewall out the early game, and which Ezreal decks are currently very good at doing, then like you're probably just gonna run away with it. If you can one for one trade them, then you can just like find your plus ones later, and it's actually pretty easy because not not a lot of them have over the top damage, and that's the thing that people don't prepare for with the spiders deck is like, uh, kinkos are pretty straightforward. Like if I kill an elusive, you don't have any like extra burn damage. There's no like. You know, they're not running Noxus, so they're not on things like Decimate. On the flip side, though, for, like, Jinx Draven, mm -hmm. I have just lost to, like, turn five, my opponent goes Decimate, and I'm like, do you just have two more Decimate? And they do, and I die. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Yeah, I think in general, Piltover decks are just super good at dealing with Elusives and Zed. Um, you just have Mystic Shot, Thermogenic Beam, and Get Excited that are 
so efficient at uh, dealing with those elusives and like elusives are understated in general um, and want and do that because they're able to avoid minion combat. So when you're just puffing up your Ezreal and also taking care of business while buffing up your Ezreal and taking their entire win condition out of the way, it, it's just, it felt very good. Yeah. I remember even back when we played Hymer Ionia, like just the Piltover cards alone would be good against elusives and then yeah. adding in some of the Noxus stuff, adding in, you know, Culling Strike and even just the one mana deal one or the whirlwind card like those are just good right kiku elusives right now definitely feel extreme at least in the matchups that i've played they have felt extremely reliant on just like getting a jeweled protector off on a uh kiku life blade and then just hoping that runs away with the game and if that doesn't happen it feels like they just fold uh one thing i did want to ask since you have the mobile tearless pulls up what champions do they say are in the bannerman deck because there's been a lot of diversity in the champions uh, of that deck uh this one says fiora garen that's kind of where where i would imagine i would go with this um, okay, because we've seen, I mean, basically you can run any combination of Lucian, Fiora, and Garen, and, like, no one's going to, you know, mm -hmm. think that you're off your rocker or anything like that. And personally, I prefer Lucian, Fiora, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I'm Lucian, Garen. I don't even remember. I've been playing with Jinx too much, and I was playing Lucian, Jinx, so I don't remember what I played in, like, an actual Mono Demacia deck. But sure. And, of course, the Fiora Shen is still on the table as well, if that's mm -hmm. the route that you want to go. But I do like that even though there's... um. You know, it's it's basically the same deck across the border. Like it's this mono Demacia Bannerman aggro. There's actually a lot of diversity within the builds for it. Maybe not on a tier list that you'll see, but like uh, at least throughout the Korean Invitational tournament, there were like some decks where it's like, okay, well you're both like basically mono Demacia, but you only have like 15 cards in common. Right. Yeah. No, I think that Fiora is interesting because she benefits the most off of bannerman um she's very good at beating a lot of the shadow isles decks and demands an answer which gives room for garen to come in which is why i think fiora garen's the most popular um senna lucian has some high roll potential where if you just see like senna on or lucian on two senna on three then you're very in control of the game and you get to be the beatdown. um i do think that uh, I would like to see more Demacia, in, or I'm sorry, more Judgment in these lists. Um, the one on Mobilitic specifically doesn't have one. Um, I'm sure that some people on Ladder are running it, but I think that it's a very good card in the mirror. I think it's a pretty good win condition, even on like turn five against the, the spider decks, um, because like you just attack with Fiora while they threw out a bunch of spiders, and if you have a big enough board where they have to block, Judgment just kind of wins the game. Um, so I think if Shadow Wilds kind of falls off a bit more, I, I'd probably say that like Lucian Garen is something interesting. I think Lucian Garen's like more aggressive, where Fiora is more uh, adjustable depending on the matchup, right? That's definitely understandable. I have some thoughts on like uh, these Allegiance decks that I'll, I'll get to at the end is like our last topic because it's just something I want to touch on. Mm -hmm. uh, but speaking of, what is our next topic? <laughs> uh, Tiana Crown Guard is my next topic. Eight mana, <laughs> tough when I'm summoned, rally. <laughs> Um, I've seen this a couple times. I was watching uh, some streams where this card would just be, it'd be like, oh, okay, uh, you know, I'm not dead on board. Even if they rally, it doesn't matter. Then they play a 7-7 seven, seven and rally, and it's like, oh, hmm, actually, I do lose. Uh, I think that adding 7 power to the board while rallying is something interesting. I've, it's only been a one of obviously, and it's unfortunately not an elite, but how do you feel about that card in Bannerman? Uh, I think the top end of the deck, like anything that costs 5 or more mana, has been um, kind of a hotly debated topic among mm -hmm. people that play the deck. Uh, some people still play some people still play Brightsteel Formation. It's yeah. kind of something that is left over from the Shen Fiora list. That's like a, uh, the slot it competes for, I think. Like Brightsteel Formation yeah. or do you just go for the, the Tiana Crown Guard? I think so Crown the, Guard's a little bit better, personally. The Shen Fiora lists were, they were at a point where they were only running Shen and Greenglade Caretaker and the rest was just this Mono Demacia Elite deck and then as people kind of cut down, they were like, okay, well, you know, Brightsteel Formation formation was great because it would auto evolve the shen but like it also just gave you huge swings in the mirror is that something that we necessarily have to cut going into a mono demacia version and a lot of people were like no so they just kept the bright steel formation then people were like okay well if we get to run this one heavy hitter what about tiana crown guard she's very difficult for the mirror to deal with you know she doesn't get barrier to my whole board but she doesn't let my board attack again i personally prefer her in the lucian build Course, because yeah, I think the Lucian and Senna having first strike lets you fight for the board a lot more effectively, aggressively. And I don't like running Relentless Pursuit in the deck, honestly. I, I feel like I you're so tight on card quality, where like every card that I draw has to do something very impactful, or I could just get outvalued. So I've always just been a fan of the Lucian. One, because it gives me access to Relentless Pursuits. Two, I think that anytime you're taking additional combat phases, I just want to have first strike. Yeah, um, the it's the only card draw you really have available to you in Demacia is going to be the the three mana three three whose name escapes me. Um, I uh, think Vanguard when, Sergeant. Vanguard something. No, it's, it's Sergeant a Vanguard, Vanguard Redeemer. 
There we How about go. that one? Yeah. Uh, Vanguard yeah, and Redeemer. Yeah, made for Demacia. Yeah, but also, like, your board kind of gets to a point where you're no longer, like, having units die, especially after you see the Bannerman. Like, you're just getting chump blocked and then comboed out is how you lose games. So the card draw is not super relevant, and there's just better things in the three mana slot especially. Uh, yeah. I, I think that it's fine to not play that card, but when you're not playing a card like that and you really just are uh, coming off the top of your deck as the only way that you're getting any advantage and you really need to kill your opponent on curve, um, I think that not having Relentless Pursuit makes a lot of sense. Um, it's cool yeah. to like have the option for it in a Lucian-driven variant, but also because you are going, make my board a bunch of 4-4s four and 5-5s five and 6-6s, six you do kind of want to upset that tempo of, oh, it's turn 6, my opponent can't attack again until turn 8, so I'm a combo deck, I'll play it out this way. Instead, it's like, oh, guess what? Actually, here's a 7-7, seven, seven, and I'm attacking you twice this turn. It, it it's kinda... understandable, and that's probably why you're not seeing as many judgments in the deck. So against mm -hmm. the Spider deck, what you want to do is you want to attack, clear out their board of chump blockers, then you relentless pursuit in combat so that they can't really reset up a board, and then you actually get a push through your damage. So people are just kind of replacing that with judgment to accomplish the same goal. Right, that makes sense. Except they get through the damage mm -hmm. instead of winning the game off Fiora. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it, it's really just an interesting thing of Fiora versus Garen versus Lucian. Hell, let's see some Luxes in Mono Demacia. Why not? I don't think there's any any eight mana spells except for Judgment. I want to play. Or six the Lux decks spells. have actually like completely fallen off as they far really as like, have, I can. Yeah. I haven't seen any in like the last three or four days. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought the Callista buffs was like, eh, she's better than she was, but I still don't think very good. And then Lux buffs were like, okay, that's actually a playable card now. And like Bannerman was already like kind of neat, but I mean, Heimer especially was going to love it. But yeah, yeah. No, just completely, completely nothing. Um, so the next topic we could talk about here is going to be that uh, the Legends of Runeterra recently announced that they're changing their card collection acquisition philosophies and everything like that. I don't have it pulled up right now, but the gist of it is that Expeditions are no longer going to give you a champion. Um, they're going to cost less uh, coin, which is basically real money. Uh, they're getting rid of the weekly cap on how many wild cards you can purchase. So you are more or less able to buy as many cards as you want. You can start a fresh account, spend probably 100 to $200, and then build every meta deck, if not every single deck in the game. So I love it. Uh, personally, um, they also uh, removed the cap for weekly vaults. Yes, I don't those even know now infinitely that... scales well. I don't know what that means, honestly. Like, what is a... so? It means you can level up past thirteen to like fourteen, fifteen, and it. Right. Uh, I think that what they were saying is that for fourteen and every level beyond that, they put another rare capsule in your vault. I see. Yeah. I was... uh, they also made it so that I believe every level past thirteen. Uh, I think to get to level thirteen, you need like thirteen thousand experience. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that to get to level fourteen and every level after it, you only need twenty five hundred experience interesting so it, it goes very far down basically and you're just kind of stacking up rare capsules as you go on yeah. with the okay yeah, yeah. I, I did see the part there they're like yeah you can infinite level now and i'm like what does like what does the level 14 chest look like and how is it different from a level 20 chest but that makes a lot it's of sense. just infinitely scaling rare capsules and rare capsules are what three rare mean? cards and two common cards i believe is what the break that was either the high roll for it or the average i don't remember exactly okay. which one so, more or less, the these changes in conjunction, I really, really love the fact that I'm not forced to play Expeditions. I do like doing an Expedition every now and then, and usually if I'm inebriated in some way, uh, I don't want to play on the Ranked Ladder, and I also don't want to play Constructed Normals. Like, I like playing Expeditions at 2 a.m. on a Friday night. It's how I like to spend my time. But I don't feel like being obligated to play through three Expeditions, and which is effectively six games if I'm really tryharding, or six full Expeditions if I'm really tryharding, just to make sure that I'm getting... I'm trying to get a champion wild card instead of just a normal champion. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, there's this weird thing where I, uh, paper card game players are constantly talking about how, like, draft is one of the best formats and, you know, this is the most optimal way to play card games. And digital TCG players seem to greatly disagree and they all fucking hate it. Uh, the biggest <laughs> feedback that I saw from, like, week one is, like, don't make me play expeditions. Like, I don't want to do it. Speaking of, though, PSA for everybody, uh, the first round of Runeterra Twitch Prime loot dropped the other day. It was a champion wild card, a epic wild card or rare wild card and an expedition token which is important because you want to play your expeditions now because on tuesday they will no longer be giving the champion what the random champion so like you want to get your expeditions done now use all those tokens now because they're going to go down in value basically mm -hmm. i think most people if you're so invested in rune tear that you're watching a podcast 
I think by this point, it's been, what, almost two months that the game has yeah. been out? Like, your collection's probably been full for, like, two weeks, honestly. Um, I yeah, I've like, maxed like... out on champions, so I, some people have been telling me you only get 750 dust, because that's what you get when you pull a champion. Some people have been telling me if you have all the champions, you get a champion wild card for finishing your expedition. I guess I'm going to find out after this. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think that it was a really cool experiment. Uh, I when, On day one of Legends of Runeterra, I was like, why can't I build the decks I want to build? Just let me throw 50 bucks at you to build one deck please like don't make me just i'm i can only have four champions it's it was it just felt so bad in week one week two it was like okay i can build like two decks that i want to play and this is way better but week three the meta has like shifted and i'm able to play pretty much any deck that i want um minus like some really fringe meme stuff and i thought that was kind of bad for streamers and i thought it was kind of bad for people who just built the wrong deck on like week one and week two and the, the inability to adapt to the meta really sucked uh, but because I had been so stingy with my wild cards, I was able to build something that like beat the elusive meta. I played Heimer, and I was like, oh, look, suddenly I'm Masters. That was crazy. And then by week four, it just felt like everyone could play whatever they wanted. So it was yeah. like it, it almost didn't even do anything. And now because I've been like I played um, and I even haven't played pretty much in, in two or three weeks for the most part. I've just been doing my expeditions and that's it. So I've been like getting my vault to like level nine or whatever, but my collection feels full. I've got 10,000 or like 12,000 dust. I've got like six champion wild cards stocked up. So I'm like, all right, we're set too. like, let's go. I've got, I'm, I'm about to like have all of it on day one anyway. Um, so I think they were kind of, it was a decision that was kind of in combination of uh, we don't really know how to enforce, force our core philosophy here where we want the meta to not be solved on day one but if everyone already has everything then it's like wow now people are going to have a hard time catching up and that's going to feel bad so for them to just kind of go back on it in a way that doesn't feel super bad i think is really really cool and this game just does it feels like this would be really good in some card games but this game is actually just like so fun when you get to mess around with all kinds of stuff like every class there one of their philosophies is just making sure that every champion has a home in some deck and while Callista doesn't fit that uh mold everyone else does so it really does feel cool to be able to play pretty much anything speaking of uh catching up one of my favorite things that they implemented is the concept of catch-up experience oh really? where yeah so a lot of people seem to overlook this one but it's actually my absolute favorite thing that they did where it is starting next patch if you are a new player or a player who is significantly behind the standard curve for like in terms of how much experience you've gained in regional progression uh they're giving you bonus experience so that you have an easier time catching up which is also going to help streamers who feel stagnant in master where it's like okay well i decided i'm going to do like an iron to master type thing like zixo is currently doing on his stream mm -hmm. uh and just like level a second account so it's like okay well now that it's a fresh account like i can actually get one or two decks i don't have to just like build a budget mono demacia thing from the get-go i can actually build a couple of real decks and like have fun climbing again mm -hmm. um so that's something that i'm really looking forward to and it's it's definitely gonna help newer players in like you know six months when we're on like set two or three and it's like okay you know anytime you come into a digital tcg and you weren't you haven't been there since day one you feel immensely behind and i really like i feel like for a digital card game i have to either be able to give you money or time and if i give you one of those i should be able to get everything yeah uh, so i really like that now they're kind of going back on the the capping the shop so i can give you money i can give you time either one because obviously i've given them time so mm -hmm. I, I like that i now have that option it feels a lot more viable to just like you know if i'm starting out six months later and it's like oh well you know i want to play the game i don't want to sit here you know i only have a couple of hours to play every night but i'm rich shit i'm gonna throw a thousand dollars at this game boom suddenly i have everything for now until it dies uh so i like that yeah. Um, I also just like that, uh, you know, it, you're still going to get rewarded for time. Like, you're not, six months from now, if you come in, you're not going to have to throw money at the game. You can actually just grind out for like a month, a month and a half, and all of a sudden you're going to be caught up to everybody. I like that a lot. It's yeah, still yeah. not the optimal online TCG format, in my opinion, but I, that's something I'll talk about later. Yeah, I think in my mind, like, I don't want to every card available and then money can be earned in other ways. I just, from like my high and mighty perspective on card games, I think that like if you're putting the time into design the set, you're designing the set like internally complete like every card in the game is accessible to your play testers so like why would you not want your players to have the same experience of the game that you play tested um but in terms of comparing legends of runeterra to a game like hearthstone or a game like magic the gathering arena um like i said i think that if you throw between 100 and 200 dollars at the game at strictly wild cards you will be able to build any deck that you want any deck that you want you will build a tier one deck you'll build a tier two deck and you will be build a meme deck for a very low price and on the flip side of that where it's money or time two weeks of grinding into a level 13 or higher vault and you will be at a very handsome collection three weeks of grinding you'll be good to go four weeks you will have everything and four weeks of just you know playing the game 
for like two hours a day, you're not going to get that at a Hearthstone. You're not going to get that at a Magic the Gathering. You need to throw so much more, and, and it's like not really heavily talked about. Um, I think a lot of people are reacting to this announcement like, oh, they're backtracking on what they wanted to do, but there's no complaints about it because everyone that played Week 1 is like, wow, we actually really want this, and then Riot's like, you got it, bro. No problem. Yeah, I think I'm actually going to make a list of like, there's a lot of things where I feel like if you are putting, let's look forward to next year, right? Like sure. if you are putting out a digital TCG in 2021, mm -hmm. there's like a checklist of 30 things that you just have to fucking have day <laughs> one. Um, Hearthstone kind of paved the way for digital TCG. So like, it's understandable that it took them a long time to like kind of figure out what worked and what didn't. And then I think Rune Terra didn't look enough at Hearthstone because Hearthstone like made a lot of mistakes and they fixed a lot of their mistakes and they went, okay, well like, these are things that people asked for for five years and we finally put it out. And I feel like there's a lot of things that like Runeterra should have had day one that they just didn't. Um, there's a lot spectator of things that I still mode? think they're missing. Is that where you're going uh, with this? Well, spectator mode is one of them. Although mm -hmm. worth noting, uh, Umbridge did confirm in a tweet that they, I think they said in the next, or their spectator mode is in the works, but they don't have a date for it and they're not going to have a date for it anytime soon. Okay. Uh, I was even thinking more of just game mechanics. Number one being, um, I should be able to hover something to figure out how many cards are in my hand. Sure. Uh, I shouldn't have to fucking try and count that because it's difficult. Two, if uh, somebody overdraws, you should put that in the little time bar on the left. Like, I, I want to be able to see what they overdrew. Like, that's something that Hearthstone... Hearthstone didn't put that shit in until, like, six years in. Yeah. And I feel like that's so basic that, like, every card game should just do that. But, I don't know. That's, that's a, something for another time. How do you feel... This is a kind of a side topic. We still have about like, 20 minutes to kill here, but how do you feel about hand tracking in Legends of Runeterra and digital card games as a whole? Hearthstone has hand tracking. Uh, Magic, as comparison, does not. You can shuffle your hand around. Your opponent doesn't know where anything is. Um, Legends of Runeterra does like reveal revealed cards, but you can see if somebody played a card off the top of their deck, and you can see if a player played a card that they kept in their opening hand. Like You have access to the information if you're playing dummy close attention, and I feel like that barrier of skill is very necessary for the highest level of play but it's so annoying to do for such little gain that i i hate the fact that if i was like seriously making a rank one grind i would be forced to do that to consider myself a serious player so i have never hand tracked in my life like i just don't do it i don't think it's i mean like obviously it's better than not doing it but it's so time consuming it's so difficult it's an incremental advantage Generally, you can get a pretty good read on your opponent anyway. It doesn't really matter if you know that they've had the card for seven turns or not. Like, it does in some situations, but they're very niche situations that don't make me feel like it's worth it the other 20 hours that I'm doing it. Uh, a lot of Hearthstone deck trackers initially would count the number... Like, they would tell you what turn your opponent drew what card. Yeah. In Rune Tear, it's a little different because if I go to play a spell from my hand, a faster or slow spell, and then I take it back, it puts it all the way to the left in my hand. It puts it in, like, my most recent card drawn slot. So it, it can actually be a little bit hard to track cards in Rune Terra because of that. I can just, like, constantly throw out spells to rearrange my hand, kind of like in Magic, where you just got to freely shuffle your hand. Right, so but it's, at the it's same like... time, if I go to play a spell that use, that is either fast or slow, and then it goes back to the left, you know now you now know that that card is Yeah, you have the, the additional information. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, like, it's incremental at best. Obviously, if you're, like, in a tournament, I would recommend, you know, taking a pad and paper and just doing it, because I know for the Korean Invitational, the deck trackers weren't legal. Yeah. Uh, you weren't allowed to use them, so, like, if you're going to hand track, you do have to do it yourself. I would highly recommend doing it in tournament. If you're, even if you're just, like, going for a serious shot at rank one, I don't think you have to do it. I'm pretty sure you'd be able to you do don't, it without it You don't easily. have to. Like, the more people that do it, the more, like, you, it's a one to two percent advantage, right? Like, it's only going to come up in a couple of scenarios where it's like, wow, yeah. it was really important for me to know that that card came off the top, or that card he was saving, and now I know that, like, his top deck isn't this card. Like, he didn't top deck uh, uh, ruination or something and he was saving it forever so he could stop another one it's just like there's a bunch of like very niche scenarios where it could come up that just like having that extra little bit of information you can kind of deduce what other cards are in your opponent's hand um but I guess, like, more specifically, what I what I dislike about it is, like, what you actually have to do as a card game player to get that information. Like, you're not watching the board or thinking critically about future turns or interactions. Like, you're actually just sitting here staring at the screen, watching your opponent's hand to see if the card moves, like, onto the field and then when it goes back. Or, like, where that card was in the position. Like, it just seems like a skill. Like, because it is a skill, it is improving your win percent by doing it effectively. But... When I play a card game and it's my opponent's turn, I'm trying to, like, have Netflix on the other monitor, you know? If I'm grinding eight hours a day for rank one, like, my mental fortitude only has so much capacity to stare at my opponent's hand the entire time. Like, do you think that in your list of things card games should do that this should even be in the game? 
Um, I understand it's probably easier to code it with just a stagnant hand. There's no real right. reason to give you the ability to shuffle up your hand. I, I don't think it's like a necessary thing. I, I don't I never like got super into the controversy of like hand tracking and whether or not like you know it's good for the game or bad for the game if you have to do it to be competitive that kind of stuff so like it's just something uh, i never like really like, note, paid attention I'm, to i'm pretty sure that like every single hearthstone pro like players that go to the world championships players that play at high levels like they all have hand track and like yes there's apps that do it but a lot of people are like they will like you will see interviews with hearthstone pros and they'll be like yeah this guy is super good at hand tracking it's disgusting and i'm like why do we ha why are we at the point where you have to do that to get that extra one percent out of your skill it just it i don't know me. whenever whenever i played force will like people would compliment me on my ability to read and it's like that's just kind of like the irl version of hand tracking so it's right, like right. i i spent so long developing the irl skill that i just translate that to online where like rather than hand track i'm just making reads like i have for the last 12 yeah. years so i'm not like i mean i could probably get better reads off of hand tracking but like exactly. i feel like it's a my reading is skill. good enough so yeah. like I I don't need to commit the extra resources because like you said like I'm I'm trying to watch Netflix I'm trying to watch YouTube I got Hulu up on the other monitor I'm watching little Dicky do dumb shit like <laughs> I'm not trying to watch your hand the whole time. Yeah, I'm just I'm just imagining like a year down the line you're in the the finals of some some Grand Prix level Rune Terror tournament and the casters are like some big pros and on the other one and I'm like yeah if he was hand tracking here he would have realized that this card was his opponent's hand and he loses because he's a dummy and that it's gonna be it you're gonna lose the finals of some nonsense for like 20 grand and you're like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be so I'm mad if like I'm just I'm just out here like destroying the tournament scene for Rune Terror. like hey can you guys let me on the caster's desk like I don't wanna I don't wanna be in the tournament let me <laughs> let me back there let me commentate I'm gonna keep winning tournaments till you let me back there yeah uh but yeah that's just like a personal thing that i i just think that hand tracking is a skill that just does not need to be in a game it's kind of like no. l canceling in super smash brothers melee like yes it's there and it's a skill but does it need to be like if they have a remade I, like melee you... i would say they didn't but you know what i mean yeah yeah if you were to be like okay well you know which is because hand tracking is probably better i mean hand tracking obviously is just better than making reads right and i would rather be rewarded for making reads than hand tracking mm-hmm and that could just be because that's what I'm used to. It mm -hmm. could be like a very ignorant statement that I just made, but I, I think that like reading your opponent is like a skill that you have to develop and like it's harder than hand tracking. Because hand tracking, I could just write your shit down and then stare at your hand and like X out the cards as you play them and be like, okay, well, this one's been here for since turn four. There's like three things it could possibly be. So I definitely want to reward players for being able to read rather than just like hand tracking. Yeah, it's just like, it's. I think that the most important scenario of hand tracking, and this is the last thing I'll kind of say on the subject we're beating to death, is that when you when you see your opponent make a play, and you're like, okay, they're making this play, which tells me they don't have this card in their hand. And then the next turn, they top deck a card, and you see them play the card at the top of their deck. And then the next turn, they top deck a card, and they see you play, and you see them play the card off the top of their deck. Now you still have that information that this card is not in their hand, even though it could have been two, maybe even three, maybe even four draws down the line. Because if you're just making yeah. reads, you say, okay, he didn't have this card, but now he's drawn four cards that I don't know, and it could be there. But if you're actively staring at your screen going, mm-hmm, yes, he played this rally off the top, then you're like, okay, and then I know exactly what cards cannot be in his hand and that's like the the best case scenario but it's still it seems like the fact that anyone can get that extra two percent out of doing that just feels like ugh, I, I hate that and i wish that's something that would get out of the game personally but i don't know how complicated that is to code like you said it's probably easier to tap it in there um yeah so next topic what is your favorite deck in the meta currently if someone was aspiring to ladder to get to masters so people ask me this all the time because I like my stream is still starting off. So most of the, my viewers are my friends and they're like, Hey, you know, I'm down in like gold or like, I'm just getting started. Like what deck do I play? And it was pretty easy before because I would tell them Elnick Ezreal mm -hmm. because the deck was extremely versatile. It was fun to play. You could do just about anything with it. Uh, outside of that, like I have no advice because I don't know, dude, like I don't, <laughs> I, I've never been the kind of person that's like, okay, like here's how to most effectively climb ladder. Like even in Hearthstone took me years to get the legend because it's like oh why don't you just play an aggro deck it's like because i don't enjoy playing aggro decks it's the most effective way to climb quickly mm -hmm. that's not how i enjoy playing the game like i i got to master playing like heimerdinger decks like i also got in really early so it's possible that i was just playing a bunch of people got the hype didn't know how to play the game it's you know so i don't i don't know how to climb effectively that is like the one thing i can't do it's why i haven't leveled a second account it's why i'm still just streaming and master even though like it doesn't do anything because mm -hmm. i have no idea how to climb I, i've never tuned into those philosophies of like this is the, but it's why I never climbed very high in like League of Legends. People are like, oh, here's like 10 tips and tricks. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, I'm just going to play my champion. I'm going to play my game. Oh, look, I got to gold. I don't think I need to climb any higher because I got the free skin. I guess we're just going to chill here for the rest of the season. So, like, I, I hit a goal and then I stopped. So, like, I, I've never really 
known how to climb because I either accomplish it very quickly. I've never in it for the long haul. Like if it took me three months to get the masters, I probably would have given up. Like, I don't know. I don't know people. It, it, it's very dependent upon your local meta. You have to cancel. You have to counter your local meta or just play a deck that is so broken that it can meet everything. And you have to stick to that. I feel like a lot of people who haven't met, hit master yet are like constantly switching between decks. Cause they'll like lose three or four games with something and be like, okay, this isn't working. I'm gonna switch over to this. And like, you just have to learn how to play a deck. Well, like, do you think I started off as a God with Heimerdinger? I did. That shit's easy. You suck. I don't know how you're not master yet. Uh, <laughs> very useful. Thank but, you. Uh, I think karma Ezreal is probably like, you just need to play a deck that lets you learn how to play the game effectively. Yeah. And then the rest will follow. I think kind of touching back on the subject we were talking about earlier, uh, my generic opinion here would actually be the Bannerman deck, but I think that um, you really need to kind of fine tune it to say what your champions are going to be. And then just like you said, get the reps on it. I think that, and I think we talked about this before, just skill in Rune Terra is very expressive. Like, you can show skill in a lot of situations. So, honestly, putting 10 or 15 hours onto a deck you enjoy and that you can mentally enjoy putting 15 hours on is going to be a lot more important than playing what is the perceived best deck or what you think the best deck is, even for your local meta. Um, and I think there is some element of you can't just play a bad matchup into uh, a meta that's like 60 percent of, of a bad matchup for you or whatever um but the most important thing is enjoying it like you were saying i'm also not really a ladder grinder we were both born and bred in the physical tcg world where the most grinding you do is you know prepping for a tournament in your basement and then it's really like half the enjoyment there is just beating on your friends and then watching them beat <laughs> on you back and just like the interaction of it so when you're just grinding a faceless ladder against a bunch of randoms with the same deck and just going up and down and up and down it's it's more grueling than anything i i feel so playing a deck you enjoy to get skill is going to be most important but try to enjoy bannerman and then figure out if you enjoy Lucian or Fiora or Karen. Yeah, I made I made a point on my stream today that like Bannerman is probably the best deck if you want to learn combat because yep. combat is extremely important with that deck. There's a lot that you can get away with if you play combat effectively and like you know what what you can scare your opponent with, what you can't. And back to your point about grinding, like just in general in card games, I've always felt like I need an end goal. Mm -hmm. um, and a ladder doesn't really promote an end goal because like I've been saying since it since the game started basically like I could hit rank one and like it doesn't matter doesn't mean anything no one's gonna remember it i'll be there for like five minutes before i lose a game tank back down to 200 and then i have to spend another 20 hours getting back up there i'm not gonna do it so like when, when i'm grinding for like tournaments in real life it was fine because like i would sit there for 15 hours because the end goal is i have a tournament in nine fucking hours and i have to win that and then i win it and i get a prize and it's great and that's why like even when me and my friends would do like 15 hour testing sessions there'd be like eight of us in the basement everybody would on average get in like five hours of testing between like deck building or tweaking or just bullshitting around. And I would put in like 13 hours of testing in the 15 hours that we were there mm -hmm. because I enjoy doing that. If I have a tournament the next day, uh, even in Hearthstone, like I played like one online tournament and it's just like, it didn't feel like a tournament. I ended up dropping out at like four and oh, because I had to go watch end game because you know, 10 hours into my tournament, only four rounds have gone by because there's so many fucking warrior mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> So I definitely would prefer like smaller invitational type tournaments. I think like large open online tournaments are kind of uh, definitely not my thing, which is another reason that I'm gearing more towards casting. But it just goes back to like the latter thing where it's like there's no end goal for me. So I, I don't really know how to do it effectively. I just kind of do my own thing and I'm good enough at card games at this point that like it just works out. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm super hyped at the idea because I think what you're implying here is like you want something off the off the ladder. Like, are you talking about like rewards, or you want an invitational based on ladder success? Because so personally, believe... if there's an invitational, I'd rather have it be like a big open qualifier, where if I make top sixteen of a big thousand man tournament, then I get to like do top cut or even a whole another tournament. Uh, like three months down the line with the top sixteen of another tournament, you know, just kind of that progressive tournament structure. So it was very difficult to find information on the Korean Invitational, but because it does have Invitational in the name, I wanted to know how the players got there. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on a very rough Google Translate on some of the early panels that they showed, it seemed like they invited the top 16 players from the Korean ladder. Okay. So that would be um, something that you want. On it's it's like incentive to climb. I mean, you need some kind of incentive to climb the ladder. Otherwise, people are just going to stop doing it. You've probably got... 2000 people in masters right now i would guess that less than half of them are actively playing on a daily basis or like even every two or three days mm -hmm. unless they're just like coming in every three days to like max out their quests then leave for another three days which is like 
not what you want to do. You want to keep your players engaged. You want to keep them constantly grinding for a system. Like in League of Legends, the idea is that like if I hit number one on the ladder, then like I'm going to get scouted by a professional team. I, I want hitting like I'm definitely a fan of open qualifiers. I don't think like you should have to grind the ladder is the only way to get into something. But I do think grinding the ladder should matter. And even if it's just like a couple of buys in a riot sponsored invitational, like that's still something. Right. And I guess moving on from that, like you said, a lot of players that have grinded to master are kind of already burnt out on the game, but we do, we should have a set, I think next month or in May, perhaps. Have we gotten any confirmation on when that is? I'm just thinking in traditional card games or every other card game ever, like sets come out every three to four months. So if the beta came out in January, I don't know if they're going to take a bit more time getting into set two uh, because it is the opening launch or if they are going to kind of keep the the schedule of every other card game existence and do three to four sets a year so four sets a year would mean that the end of may should be when set two comes out but if it's a three if it's four sets a year we should see something even earlier so i would assume that set two is going to drop with the release of the game and if i if my timelines are running out correctly and i'm remembering every piece of information that i've consumed about rune terror over the last six months uh they have said that release will happen with the mobile release like the full release of the game is going to happen at the exact same time as mobile it, the only date confirmation I think we had was that it was going to happen after TFT Mobile came out. Uh, TFT Mobile came out two weeks ago, so now we're kind of in open air here. It could happen at any time. I could wake up tomorrow and they're like, Green Terra's out, and also here's set two. I would imagine set two is going to drop with the release. Um, I don't remember how long there was between Hearthstone leaving beta and Nax Ramis coming out. It might, I think it was like. It, Nax Ramus might have even dropped in beta. I really don't remember because there, it didn't feel like there was a difference between Hearthstone not being in beta and then Hearthstone being in beta. Yeah. And I think that you would really need like the set launch of like quote unquote set two, which would technically be set one, I guess. Um, I don't know how they're going to handle. I don't think they've talked at all about like rotation or if they're going to do because there's no packs. So like, what would you yeah. even rotate? Uh, I don't know if we're going to be getting. So let's say we get Bilgewater and Targon. Is that what the perceived i believe so yeah we've seen like gangplank nautilus fizz twisted fate and i think misfortune are the the leaks or potential champions okay that we're looking so at. i think Tom if we get as well so let's say we get just bilgewater right are they going to expand upon the current existing regions and if they do does that mean bilgewater is already an inherently bigger thing in order to match the size of the other regions because that's always kind of tricky because obviously we haven't seen the death priest or death knight or whatever for hearthstone drop yet and the, a lot of the concerns that i would have about them dropping an entirely new class this late in is it's like it's base level cards are comparing to base level cards that were designed 10 years ago. Yeah. So the base level cards for the snooze thing should be a, a power creeped towards what we're currently at. And I'm afraid that like if Bilgewater comes out, it's going to be like power crept already. And I don't want to start the power creep too early. Mm -hmm. um, especially because like they did mention, you know, one of their big things was like, we want you to, we want the meta to stay open. We want progression to be slow so that you can spend longer amounts of time in this open meta and enjoy that and i think they really realized recently as players were starting to complete their collections where it's like oh well if we take like another three months to drop a set everybody's going to be able to buy it day one and that's not going to go towards our philosophy of we want these things to the metas to take a while to develop where if everybody's got it day one it's like you threw money at it except i just threw the last three months on it while you sat on your hands not making any cards right I'm also curious to see, those are like the leaked champions that we do have confirmed or, you know, spoiled or whatever you want to call they, it. They were data mined. Yeah, data mined. Um, and it, it appears that only six were data mined. So that would lead me to believe that they're not expanding other champions into the other regions. I imagine they want to keep the number of champions in each region consistent. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if down the line you're seeing, you know, seven or eight champions per region where, you know, Demacia, Shadow Isles, Noxus, every, everybody gets an extra champion at the same time they launch another region. Or if they're just going to do set two is Bilgewater. Set three is an extra 50 cards in the seven regions that we already have, you know? Um, I what think I'm very excited for is... Oh, go ahead. I just think an extra region right now is going to be great for the game. That's what people really want is just like more options, more decks. But moving forward, I don't think we'll be getting a new region with every expansion. I think we'll be getting more depth into the regions that we already have. Absolutely. And I think Runeterra has actually, I, I really want to like take my hat off here to him. I'm not going to because I'm in quarantine and cut my own hair. That's why I'm wearing a hat. Um, but I think they have done a phenomenal job where, uh, so the colors in Magic the Gathering, each of them have like this strong identity and they do something different than all the other things. Uh, in Legends of Runeterra, I feel like the regions don't do different things than the other regions. Uh, like they have their own unique identity, but like you can play the kind of style any way you want. For example, like Building mono red control in Magic the Gathering, really not going to be much of a thing. That's really nothing. Like, it's not going to work out. It's mono red aggro or bust. 
But in, in Rune Terra, I feel like I can build like a Shadow Isle aggro mid range control or combo deck. And I feel like I have those four options available to me, no matter what regional combination I play. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be difficult for a new region coming in to still fit that identity where it's like we don't want to go too all in on like making this the aggro region. We still want to give you a lot of control combo mid range type cards so that you feel good mixing and matching this with other regions and you can continue to like play any kind of deck in any kind of region. And that's something that Noxus has felt very weak for a very long time. But now with the Ezreal Draven decks really coming to fruition, they had been a thing for a while, but now they're like really picking up steam. Mm -hmm. And that's really showing us the diversity of Noxus that it felt like it had been lacking for a while. And that was with no new cards coming out, no new buffs to the cards. It's just a shift in the meta. And I'm really excited to see that continue as we add more regions and more cards to the regions. Yeah, I, I honestly have been saying for a long time, and I think Noxus has some of my favorite spot removal in the entire game. I think Culling Strike is a very, very good card. I think Whirling Death is a very, very good card. Um, but really, Noxus didn't have that late game either kill you uh, mechanic or like a late game stabilization tool. And that's largely in part because um, the vampires don't have any lifesteal. So if you take damage in Noxus, you can't really gain it back. And I think that's kind of where I'm going is that vampires should have lifesteal. But if you <laughs> splash it with Ezreal, then uh, you can actually win the game, so you don't need it. Um, but yes, yeah, so I one shout out. I'm gonna try to get that in every episode. Oh my god! Uh, so yeah. Anything else you want to talk about while we're finishing up here? Yeah, there was something that I had wanted to start on that I kind of just lost for a second. Give me a second, I'll remember it. Talk for like 30 seconds, and I'll come up with it again. I'm going to talk for 30 seconds while you come up with it again. No, I think uh, for the most part, I'm super excited for set two. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we can kind of get our hands on some spoilers. I would love to see if Runeterra is doing a spoiler season like most other games do. I or... remember now. Okay, thank you. What is it? Okay, I'm going to cut you off. Um, All right, cool. <laughs> so Hearthstone started off as the World of Warcraft card game. Right. And I because there's so much history to World of Warcraft, I don't think they've really split off from it yet and like made their own things. But... There's a very limited amount of lore in League of Legends. There's a right. limited number of champions, and there's a limited number of champions to each region. And honestly, I think the most that any region has is like 10 champions or something like that. And that's the most. Some of them only have like five or six. So what I'm wondering is, is how long is it going to take before Rune Terra is no longer the League of Legends card game, and it takes on a mind of its own? If you've been following Project A, which I think is now Valorant mm -hmm. at all, you'll notice that it basically has nothing to do with League of Legends. It yep. just takes place in the same universe. And right now, Runeterra feels extremely tied to League of Legends, and I'm wondering how long until, like, because let's say every time you add a set, you want to put a new champion in each region. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to cap out on that pretty fucking immediately. Yeah. So how long until it's like, okay, here's this Noxus champion that doesn't exist in League of Legends, but they're a champion in Legends of Runeterra. And suddenly, like, we're getting more on added onto the expanded universe of League of Legends as, like, original, unique Runeterra content. Uh, I've gone really deep in the lore of like Rune Terra versus League of Legends lately, so like I know we've already branched out a little bit, but I want to see like new champions coming up, and like maybe a champion comes out in Rune Terra, and it's like, oh, this is really cool, and like there's a massive, positive, overwhelming feedback from the community on it, and then you know sometime down the line we like either add references to that in League of Legends, or we even put that champion in League of Legends, and it'd be really cool to see like Rune Terra do it first, and then the League have to follow suit due to an overwhelming community response, and that's something that I'm just really looking forward to. But I am wondering like how because league of legends has really slowed down production of champions i think they're currently doing like four champions a year yeah and if runeterra is going to follow suit on doing three or four sets a year like most card games do and you're going to be adding you kind of have to add champions every set right like those are the most exciting things those so, are the, yeah. the things you tie your the identity of your deck to so we're gonna start to outpace league of legends pretty quickly assuming that we're adding champions every set and we're doing like three or four because there's only like there's actually a lot of regions in league of legends i think it's like almost 20 um, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think we're going to start to overtake them on the champion route relatively quickly, and I'm excited to see how Runeterra uh, is allowed to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, just looking at, you know, we compare Hearthstone to World of Warcraft uh, and then Runeterra to Le League of Legends. Uh, Hearthstone's been out for uh, almost 10 years now, and they're still just pulling stuff from World of Warcraft because it is a very story-driven game. Um, it has kept up with a lot of lore aspects that gives... Uh, the, the game uh, gives Hearthstone a lot of room to pull from, um, but League of Legends was never very lore-driven. It was just kind of like, here's a better Dota, and then we're going to like throw some lore on top of it. And they've rebraked the lore like three or four times, but because they are... The lore site is actually extremely expansive at this point. <laughs> yeah, because they are doing so many yeah. uh, extra lore-driven things. You know, they've worked with Marvel to make comic books that have characters for Lux and Jin and Zed that aren't in League of Legends. They have um, these other avenues that can go down, and because they're doing all this extra projects and they're contracting out these other studios to make standalone games what am i looking at we're showing off cythria 
Oh, <laughs> oh um, not in League of Legends. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I thought you were talking off Charmander in the background. I'm like, what's going on here? No. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, because they have like Project, uh, the, the, because they have Valorant, because they have this fighting game coming out. And I, I assume the fighting game will probably use mostly League of Legends characters. Um, but you know, there's a lot there's of other champions. You can fit that in a fighting game. Yeah, yeah. Like they're gonna have those. But because Valorant specifically already has shown us these six characters that are not in League of Legends. Um, I would not be surprised if Valorant in six months is a faction in Legends of Runeterra and all the champions from Valorant are their own, like, set. I, that would, that, it would blow my mind if that does not happen in a year, because I, I think it's guaranteed almost. Like, it, it How has long to be. until, um, so obviously you log into Battle.net and you get, like, a list of five games. How long until League of Legends has to make it so that their client is similar, where, like, you, lo you log into, like, Riot.net and it's like, all right, which of our, like, six games are you going to play? I imagine... By the end of 2020, aren't they, didn't they just confirm the reworking the client again? I almost yes, guarantee. Yes, but I think that they're just bug be. fixing. I don't know if they're taking uh, TFT out of it. I, I no, I think that they're gonna like change the login screen so that oh, TFT, okay. League of Legends, Valorant, uh, Rune Terra, their fighting game is all gonna be on one. Yeah, like you get to pick which one you log into. You don't just have to double click the League of Legends icon or the Legends of Runeterra icon. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. the League of Legends. If I want to play Team Fight, I need to go into League of Legends. And if I want to play uh, Expedition, as long as they don't like, Runeterra. as long as they don't like separate separate out the game modes. Like, oh man, I have to like log into a separate client to play ARAM versus like just being oh, in a no, League no, no. client. It would still be in the League of Legends yeah. for sure, for sure. I would um, hope so. But I think that's all for us now, folks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming back. After our hiatus, we will be making this uh, a lot more weekly, and I will be playing more Legends of Runeterra for everyone. Uh, he's been playing a lot. He can tell you more about how fun the game is and how great it is. So one thing that I actually did want to touch on. So the last two streams that I did was like trying to find a home for Jinx that wasn't just like Jinx Nox as aggro. Sure. Um, and I, I splashed it into the Demacia deck, the, the Bannerman Allegiant deck. And I was like, okay, well, like this deck doesn't like refuel super well. I'm like, that's all Jinx is. So I put in like jinx and augmented experimenter and i was like okay now i've got like refuel for this very board centric deck that doesn't have a lot of card draw and i came to the conclusion that jinx sucks she's not going to find a home in anything that isn't noxus you can just run augmented experimenter in any deck like that and it'll be better and that, that was going to like segue into a thing about allegiance but honestly we are kind of out of time and i don't really know where i wanted to go with that but i did want to say try augmented experimenter in your mono demacia deck it's not bad we could not have ended the podcast on any worse advice um but make sure to come back next week anyway and thanks for watching everyone take it easy